Yeah? Good. All right. Um, building better educational games faster. Uh, the power of uh, modular design. So uh, I'm Oliver, uh, CEO and co-founder of Game Tailors. And at Game Tailors, uh, we make tailor-made educational games. Hold on. That was a bit double. Isn't this a fine if I just use this one? Okay. Okay. All right. All right. So uh, tailor-made educational games. Um, we're founded in 2016. It's quite a while ago. Uh, we're situated in Delft, in the Netherlands. As you can see, it's quite far away. Um, really enjoying my time here, by the way, so uh, it's nice to be here. Um, and uh, we've grown to about 14 people, uh, which is really great. We have a great team. And um, I have a little video that I hope I can show. Um, so you can see a little bit what we do. Yeah, if we can stop. Yep, nice. All right, uh, that was some uh, some of our work. Uh, we have a vision around the things that we do, and I would like to share that because it's a beginning to towards that uh, modular design. Um, we think that humans are inherently curious and explorative, hence that's why we like to travel to new places. Uh, we also think that people enjoy solving problems. Uh, that's very satisfying. Let's say, for instance, even if you would be improving your crop, crop yields. Uh, Play often results in learning. So whenever people play, uh, even if it's just a hobby, you will probably learn a lot. And uh, we believe that we learn better with interesting stories, um, especially if they're inspiring and, and they have big impacts. Uh, for instance, uh, great teachers inspire through storytelling. Um, and we are social creatures, so uh, we aim to be valued by others uh, and we want to be valuable in society. Uh, so, for instance, uh, we would like to cook a delicious meal for our guests. Uh, so, in general, learning should be the reward. Uh, make the content interesting. That's, that's key to us. Uh, we want to minimize the amount of extrinsic rewards, which means points, badges, all these kinds of things, because the rewards are extrinsic. And with intrinsic, like Rob said earlier, uh, uh, the impact is much more powerful. Uh, so, with that, our mission is to make playful learning the norm. However, if we would like to make playful learning the norm, there are some challenges here. Uh, to start, whenever you make applied games, uh, they are largely made from scratch, and even if they're not, they're still quite hard to maintain. And they take a lot of time to make as well, which makes them also very expensive. And they may be missing a lot of key features because you just didn't have enough budget. Uh, then there's another challenge, because if you would want to use external platforms that uh, can reuse components, they're often, at least to us, not flexible enough, not dynamic enough, not even gamey enough, uh, it's not fast enough to iterate and, and insert new content, uh, and they're often not extendable uh, as well, so we would like to plug in our own simulations and custom code. Uh, and then the third challenge, if there is a platform uh, and they have gamification things, it's often focused on the extrinsic rewards, like I said before. Uh, and it's very important here because um, extrinsic rewards can kill intrinsic motivation. Let, let's look at that from a research perspective. So uh, this meta-analysis reviewed 128 studies and confirmed that extrinsic reward tend to have a significant negative effect on intrinsic motivation. Uh, especially for tasks involving interest and enjoyment. 
So, in essence, someone who was interested in a subject and they may be getting a gamified subject may lose interest in that subject because of the extrinsic rewards. All right, so we needed a solution. Um, we wanted to have a modular design system because whenever we have clients come to us and ask us to build some kind of game, uh, there are a lot of things that we want from those games. Uh, but it's often very different as well, but there's a lot of overlap as well. So what we would like to have is a set of tools, maybe like a Lego box of things that we can connect together. Uh, so for each game, we already have most components laying around and we just need to focus on some specific key parts for that client. Uh, so we need reusable modular game systems and mechanics uh, for this tailor-made playful learning games. Uh, and we want to put education first, right? And it should be have this game feel out of the box, um, um, but it should also be agnostic to the platform or content that it has, and also to the genre. So with that, we created Learn Plus, which is a platform to design, build, test, and deploy, and run uh, games, but also even track sessions that are played by, by users. Um, to begin, uh, to give you an idea of how this is structured, um, most of our games uh, often have some kind of progression flow. Right? You, you're progressing through a story or maybe through some knowledge tree. And each node in this uh, progression flow, um, we want to have some environment. Um, there will be some missions in that environment that you can explore and try. Each mission then consists of a tree or a sequence of activities. And this can be a decision tree, basically. So you chat with someone, you give an answer, it brings you to a different route in, in this tree. And you aim to get to the right answer, of course. Um, but we also have a lot of other components that we want to use or reuse or maybe not use, uh, which are objectives. We want to show the player some kind of objectives that they have. We want to show them that they've achieved those objectives. Hey, you wanted to learn this? Now you've learned it. Um, there are also characters in most games, so we want to have a database of our characters. Um, we can also give them uh, emotions, uh, some kind of animations or specific sounds whenever they talk. Um, but basically add characters and we can reuse them whenever a player has a conversation. Uh, and then we also want to have a system to have items because during games we sometimes just want to give out things, maybe puzzle pieces, keys or, or hints to, to, some, uh, to solve some problem. Um, and then we also have story pieces that we want to stick together. We want to tell the, the, uh, the player something about what's happening right now. Uh, maybe they're um, making some kind of uh, uh, therapy uh, session uh, with, uh, with, a, with a client and uh, the story needs to explain to them what's happening and, and how they should react to the, to the uh, client, for instance. Um, and to make it really dynamic, it's important to incorporate variables as well which means that uh, whenever a player chooses something, uh, somewhere else in the game, in another mission, something may change based on this variable. Um, and of course, to have that, it's very important to have conditionals. So whenever a variable is some certain value or something happens, or maybe some mission has never been completed, another mission may not even be available or uh, will become available. Then we have an inventory system for all these items. We have backgrounds that we can collect, add some background noise, uh, for these backgrounds as well. Uh, we have a library of in and out animations, transitions between screens, special effects, and even audio effects. Um, we can look at them a little bit more in depth. So when you have a, a progress tree, um, it really helps to put the content, the learning material at the core because you're progressing through the learning material. We put that at the center. That's, that's very important to us. Um, but then what's really nice for the players is that they can also see themselves learning because they, they grow in this, in this tree. This is an example of one of our games. It uses this uh, progress tree. Um, and this one is another one, but then we use it more like chapters. Uh, so as you can see, you can use it in different ways. Um, and that makes it very flexible as well. So whenever you're in a node in this pro progression tree, you can have environments with missions. But these environments are usually, for us, 2D. We don't need to make most of them 3D because it takes a lot of time. And nowadays, with uh, uh, AI art generation, uh, it saves a lot of time as well because we can generate most of our art. 
Um, we still use, of course, uh, artists, by the way, because uh, we need to bring all that content together, but it really empowers them. Um, so uh, this environment could be, for instance, uh, a building like this, uh, but it could also be a, a map, a top-down map. Uh, but it could also be an object. Maybe uh, you have to solve some problem in an engine. So you see a picture of an engine and there are missions on certain locations on that engine. Um, and it's even possible to navigate between different environments. So an example, for instance, is this game uh, where we see the map of Rotterdam, which is a city in the Netherlands, uh, where most of these players were situated. Um, and they see all these kinds of missions that they can start. And then for this other game, for uh, uh, electromagnetism students, uh, you can see how we use the, this navigation system where you click on things, you see that you can navigate through them and go to different parts of the environment. And then we can even reuse it in a totally different way. We can make it look like it's a, a app UI. It doesn't per se need to look very gamey. So in this case, uh, a game was built for very young children to discover the world and themselves. Um, and it needed to be uh, not too gamey because it had to be focused on the things that they are going to do in these activities. All right, so then once you start a mission, a mission, like I said, consists of a tree of activities. Um, there are many activities that we've already added, but it's very easy to plug in new ones. So this makes it very modular. All the systems that we have in place, we can turn off or on if we like. So for instance, a chat activity. Um, as you see on the right, we have some different styles to them, uh, but we, we use them a lot for most of our games because we have to convey some kind of information. Um, we have these message types also extendable, so for instance, a uh, NPC could send you in a 3D object, for instance, that you need to investigate. Um, that's also possible, or maybe a video or an image. Uh, so some possible use cases that you can have with a chat like this is that a player can obtain knowledge, maybe interrogate a su suspect in an investigation, uh, or maybe you simply want to use it for assessment. Uh, and it's also very good for roleplay. And then we have a very simple click activity, which is basically you have an image and give some locations that are hotspots. And whenever you click on it, what should happen? That, that's what you then define. Uh, but you can use it to navigate through environments as well, maybe investigate uh, things and see if you can find some um, um, items related to, to a case. Uh, but you can also use it for, for assessment as well. Uh, and as you can see, we have a gamey view, but we also have a app view, which is all built with the same system. And then you have the drag and drop activity, uh, where you can define items that you can drag, and uh, where they should be dropped and should not be dropped. Um, and these are ways to, for instance, create puzzles, uh, custom puzzles, or maybe you want to do some kind of assessment by asking them, hey, put these cards in order. You're uh, starting an engine. What needs to uh, be put on first, what do you need to trigger first, and uh, what then, what second, etc. Um, so this is an example of a click activity um, where they have to highlight uh, a problem in a 3D print. So the players were learning about 3D printing and uh, they have to figure out where the problem lies in this 3D print um, and then continue on. And a drag and drop activity like this one, uh, it, it's basically a, a, a quiz, but a bit more beautiful, uh, is where they have to drag in the right uh, uh, plastics for a certain goal they have. They wanted to print a, a, um, a cog in a system, and um, uh, they need to use the right plastics, which they have learned previously. And then we have the activity of the control panel. The control panel is very powerful uh, because it allows us to make a lot of uh, interesting um, uh, mechanics with regards to uh, keypads or, or keyboards. You can make combination locks. Maybe you have to open some kind of door, find the numbers to some kind of solution, uh, and then use that to, to get to the next missions. Uh, but you can also add buttons and all these kinds of things. And possible use cases would be, for instance, that users have to set up a machine, maybe you have the control panel to uh, launch a rocket, uh, you know, they can open a box, these kinds of things. Uh, this is an example for the electromagnetism game. Um, so there are these, uh, it's basically an escape room-like puzzle uh, where you see these equations and they have to match it with the right descriptions. 
And then we have a general quiz activity as well where you can assess uh, the players, but it has some added features where you can uh, tag certain questions uh, with regards to what topics they, they match. So in the end, you can see that users are perhaps uh, not that great with a certain topic of electromagnetism because they often got those questions wrong. Uh, but this is also brought back to the user, so they get feedback. Hey, um, uh, you didn't do well on this topic, maybe you should spend more time studying this. Um, and if we would like, we can even add maybe references to the books that they need to watch, or maybe the uh, uh, read, or maybe the, the lectures that are recorded. And then uh, the most powerful part is uh, the custom activities. Because every time a client comes to us, they probably want something custom. So in this case, uh, one of the games for the children in Rotterdam, uh, they needed to also experience what it means to, to program robots. Um, so we have a custom activity that we built where they have to uh, program this robot, which is this crane, and needs to pick up the container and bring it to the ship. So they play around with this, all these uh, coding rules and figure out what it means to code. And um, it's, it's a playful learning environment as well. And then in the middle, uh, we see one that we made for Theo Eindhoven uh, for the electromagnetism game, where students can play around with um, transmission lines, where the um, uh, impedance is simulated and they have to figure out what kind of problems uh, they may face uh, in these cases. And the bottom left is one where we worked with a quantum uh, tic-tac-toe game, uh, which is pretty cool. And for this uh, game for kids, we added some very simple custom activities where they simply uh, are able to record audio or take pictures and it's added to their inventory as an item. So what's also really great is that uh, most of the styling of this system um, is based on a single spreadsheet. Uh, so we can easily swap new sprite sheets and restyle the game. Uh, except for fonts, fonts are different, of course, and, and audio, but um, we can always swap these out if we, if we like. But it's already great out of the box. So if we want to start a game, we can easily iterate fast because everything is already set up with good enough uh, uh, layouts. In addition to making these games, we, of course, need a place where we build them. So we really don't want to rely, per se, on a system like Unity. Um, so all the data of the game that's being built is online. It's stored on the database. Um, so we have a web platform for uh, um, our game designers to actually build this game. Um, and uh, it's also possible to collaborate with our clients. So it's very often the case that a lot of our texts need to be checked with our clients. Maybe they even need to give a lot of the content because we are not the experts on their field. They are the experts in their field. So we really need their help. Um, so it's very valuable that they can also uh, work in the system. Then, of course, we have the game. Uh, it works in Unity right now, um, but it doesn't have to be per se because the game itself is very tiny. It simply loads uh, all the data from our server and then runs the game live. Which also means that it loads all the resources only as needed. So it doesn't uh, load all the assets at once. And of course, we also added Cloud Safe so that users can continue playing on later. And then there's, of course, the web portal where teachers are able to track the progress of their students, and maybe plan some sessions. Um, um, and even uh, manage these players, send out invite codes, etc. That's also very important. These are all systems that we, every time for every game, we probably need. Uh, and what's also really great is that it's, it gets more powerful with every project. Because every time a client wants something new, we perhaps, if, it, if it's uh, generic enough, we can add it to the system. So one of the things that we are adding right now is, for instance, a multiplayer feature. Because uh, if we have this variable system and we track variables, we can sync it with other players where we can say, hey, you're playing together in the, in the same game. One person is in, in, in one room uh, and it's reading some kind of information, triggering a button, and in someone else's uh, game, it should open a door. Well, because we sync these variables, we're able to do that now. Um, and in addition, we added a notification system. So it's possible to notify users that they need to come back because they have some uh, things still to do. So in summary, uh, this um, means Learn Plus 
consists of the creation process uh, that we already uh, had at Game Tailors, but we now have this game maker uh, and a modular game and a teacher portal as a complete ecosystem for testing, iterating, building, and deploying our games. So, uh, in summary, it, it allows for rapid integration uh, of a lot of content, and uh, the games that we make are tailor-made where it counts, which means that we only use our developers or, or um, uh, it takes most of the time now only to work on the content story and design so, because we took out a lot of the development time. Um, but also, by the way, to make the game more juicy, you know, all these animations are already included. Uh, so it also means that it's very much faster to deliver new games. Um, and uh, this really allows us to make learning itself generally interesting. Uh, yeah, so that means significantly more value for the same investments for our clients. And I hope this inspired you uh, to increase the efficiency uh, of your game development. I would like to hear more about that. Um, so to conclude, do you have any questions? As in, as you said, you have to add different uh, like notification and multiplayer support as the client uh, like asks for new things, right? But uh, as in, you have already developed the systems. That's why you can rapidly develop other systems, right? Yeah. So, uh, what if player like you have to build custom systems over and over again? Mm -hmm. Then, is there any panel so like uh, developers can program like? A direct integrated uh, through your website or something? Um, let's see if I understand your question. Uh, so your question is, um, if people already build a lot of things, is it possible to integrate it in, into the system? You already have um, many systems, right, in place. Yeah. So you have this platform, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. So in that, you have to, uh, what if there are some custom things? Like, the, is this proprietary uh, in to you? Yeah. Oh, I see. So, okay, I thought like we have to, uh, as we have to code a specific stuff as well. Oh, no, so um, we built this platform, uh, but it's very extendable, so we can make anything with it, but we're very open to licensing and have other people use the system as well and uh, expand on it because, you know, it's modular, we can add things, change things, even the map environment could be 3D if it's necessary. Uh, I see, I get it now, thank you. Ah, right, cool. Um, what do you think like uh, replacing assessment of school and universities with your game? Uh, so uh, the question is how we can use it to uh, assess students and universities? Uh, yes, to replace uh, that uh, school and university assessment with ah, your game. To replace it, yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah, definitely. Um, so one of the challenges there is that most of the content is uh, set in stone in the sense that it's designed on online and I think if you want to assess things it would be really great to have a database of questions that you have ready um, that you can scramble and serve to the students. Um, I guess it should be possible if we have random variables. Um, yeah, it could definitely be interesting. Of course it takes a little bit more time to still make it in this instead of you know these dry questions uh, but it saves a lot of time uh, compared to you know building it from scratch so I think there's a lot of opportunity here to to yeah 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 it would be really great if, if this is a way to assess how they perform definitely because it also puts them into the context you know, because you can create environments that puts them in the context uh, and it makes it much more much more meaningful for them so I think that would be really cool uh, what strategies can be used to validate uh, modules of an educational game? Uh, where are you? <laughs> I'm trying to see where you are. Oh, there you are. Uh, so, my question is, uh, what strategies can be used to taste and validate modules uh, for educational games? 
like taste and welfare. Uh, can you repeat the question? I'm not sure I understood. Like for effectiveness before implementation, you aim. Like what strategies is this? Like to test the game. Okay. Ah, ah, I see. Um, so your question is, uh, what strategies do we use to test the game to make sure that it works as intended? Yeah. Mm, a good question. This it really depends on the situation, but most of the time uh, we do a lot of testing. Uh, and what's really useful with testing is to have the target group play it. Um, and what's also very important sometimes is that they're not really aware that this is a test uh, because then they will behave differently. Um, and then view them using the game and of course you need to assess in some way afterwards if they understood the, the content uh, but it depends on of course the situation of the game because if you make a game that's probably about assessment then the game of course assessed their knowledge um, but then you can do another assessment for instance uh, to compare those results well, like, like let's say you have a dry assessment that's very simple uh, on paper and then you have this game assessment and then I guess you can compare these and see if the assessment is uh, similar uh, or maybe even better, that's, yeah. Oh well. Like I said, it's, it depends on the situation, but um, testing a lot really helps. Um, I hope that answers your question. Do you have an edit feature for special educator? A feature for special educator means uh, if I want to provide some special fe special feature to neurodivergent uh, kids, is there any uh, added feature in that? Do you consider the point? Uh, I'm, I'm, I still didn't understand. So, a special feature for special educator neurodivergent kids. Yeah. Ah, ah, okay. Um, not at this moment, but it's uh, yeah. We can add those things. We we've added these things for other games. Uh, so there's. The only reason it's not in here is because we haven't had the question to ha implement it in these. Um, but yeah, it's definitely possible. Um, one of the problems with using Unity with regards to uh, people that, for instance, are visually impaired, um, is that you have a screen reader. The screen reader doesn't read the Unity screen. That's very difficult. So we had to create a plugin for Android and iOS and stuff. Uh, that mimics the UI of the game, but then in the native UI. And then a screen reader was able to navigate through the UI of the game. And it's something that we have, we haven't just added it here, but yeah, definitely can do it. Yeah. So one more question. How are you separating the students? Uh, because in Dutch it's different. In India, the students are different. So how are you are validating the students? How can you modify that? Uh, things occurring to the students? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, uh, to accommodate for different target audiences, um, what really helps is that this platform allows for fast iteration. So, um, the first thing I would try is see what happens if we deploy a, a Dutch version, see how they respond. If, if it's not responding well, then we should, of course, adjust it. Um, but it's, you know, very easy to do that, uh, depends on the amount of change that we need to implement, of course. Um, but general, in general, all these systems that we have in place are, uh, of course, compatible with all kinds of cultures and, uh, and content. It's m more the content that we build inside of it that may need to change. Um, so it will be very important to talk with the target audience, uh, figure out what they like, uh, what's going on in their mind, and how uh, their interests may relate to the learning objective. So to make it really intri intrinsic motivating, uh, you need to understand them with regards to the uh, learning material, right? Does that answer your question? Actually, I want to know uh, which category you are choosing the students. So this is uh, this kind of student, target audience, how are you that? How do I um, determine the target audience? Yeah. Because country like India, lots of different children are there. Yeah. So, 
Yeah, many differences in the people. Yeah, uh, I guess it's a little bit more easy in our case. Um, you're always trying to find an overlap uh, and talk with as many uh, different target audiences uh, within your target audience as possible. Uh, and when you find an overlap, that will help a lot because then you only have to build on this. Uh, but if there isn't, then obviously we need to, you know, accommodate for that. Uh, but the most important thing, I guess, in this case is to try to find as many of them, uh, maybe even bring them in a room together um, and see what the differences are and their uh, overlaps. But generally, whenever we get a client uh, that asks us to build a game, it's already quite clear what the uh, target audience will be. Uh, but of course, within the target audience, there are a lot of differences that are still, of course, uh, difficult to assess, but very important. Yeah. Hi, uh, I'm Raki. Uh, we are coming from Gamita. We are a game-based learning firm. We do, we do corporate trainings and uh, uh, we do provide assessments and reports for hmm. the facilitators. You know, we empower the facilitators with our tool. Hmm. So we have a sci-fi uh, background, a storytelling. Oh. So... Uh, I want to know what kind of collaborations are you you're looking for in the future or in India specifically? So what are your ideas or do you have any ideas or approach towards it? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, I'm not really sure yet. So I'm here to explore this, uh, figure out what it is that we can uh, provide. So even this talk, I hope to inspire people to make maybe a similar modular system if that helps them. Uh, but we're very much open to licensing or uh, if it's used for schools, maybe uh, if, if uh, students work with it to, to learn game design or whatever. Uh, it's also very interesting. Um, but um, yeah, so currently, uh, since this platform is quite young, uh, there are some rough edges, which means that we ourselves know the system very well, uh, but to give it to other people, I think that's a very interesting test because that will show us the, the shortcomings, I guess, uh, and where we need to fix things. And I definitely want to do this because I think it's very important to have this system out in the open in some way. Um, if not this, then maybe another system because I think it's very valuable. I think we should make playful learning the norm, like I said, and if it's still expensive to make educational games, uh, then we will not get there. Um, so a collaboration could mean maybe you just license it and we help you, we guide you, we, we give some workshops maybe. Uh, but it could also be interesting if some companies want to build games with it. Um, or maybe we make games for companies in India. Uh, these are all possibilities. Maybe even open an office in India. I don't know. Right. Cool. Um, like one more question I have. Yeah. Like, uh, can we convert uh, like complex subject like calculus and all those things as a game or like uh, can can it be possible like there are a lot of complex uh, topics are there yeah so can we do it or uh, like uh, you have already done it yeah yeah um, so uh, this game for uh, students that learn electromagnetism on TU Eindhoven is a very, very complex subject. Uh, it's one where only 40% or maybe 30% of the students pass. Um, so it was important to create this playful learning game and to allow them a different way to experience this, this content. Uh, it takes a lot of time. It's not easy, but it's doable. Um, it's very important to help these players understand these uh, very handy tools that will help them understand, for instance, uh, complex topics. But it may also help them figure out the shortcomings. Maybe they uh, linear algebra. Maybe that's something that they haven't learned much about um, and they didn't know yet. Because if you don't know much about a subject, you often over value how much you know. Um, so these are things that we can definitely work with as well. Um, but to answer your question simply, I think, yeah. Cool. Well, thank you. And thanks for being here.
Thank you so much, Oliver. That was an excellent session. And uh, we also feel that the, the whole world of serious games is expanding. There was a phase when nobody understood what applied games and serious games were. But now it's gained so much traction that we are finding ways of rapidly developing them. And we're talking about a huge number of consumers and users. And some great questions uh, at the back about uh, complex topics and how they can be tackled through serious games. So I think it's been a very interesting day. And uh, I, I see that some of you have been steadily here through the day since morning for Applied Games. Uh, thank you so much for that. And I hope you enjoyed all the sessions. We do have a couple of uh, more sessions for Applied Games coming up later, uh, maybe on the 15th. So there's one on uh, climate change and the other on games for limited mobility. So do look out for those. And other than that, please continue to enjoy the conference. Thank you and have a great day. Bye.